Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Marcel Cosman. And I'm Hannah McGregor. And Marcel, I have a special request for today's sorting chat. What is it, Hannah? I know that in just a few weeks, there will be a Harry Potter trivia night in Edmonton with questions written exclusively by you. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we could do like a mini trivia round right now and test if I actually know anything about these books. That's a great idea. What an excellent opportunity to plug this event, Hannah. Beercade, a drinking establishment in Edmonton, Alberta, is hosting four, not one, but four Harry Potter trivia nights, each one focusing on two of the movies. And so the first trivia night, which will be taking place on June the 8th, so in like one week from this incredible air date. It's been. That first trivia night is going to cover exclusively Sorcerer's Stone and Chamber of Secrets. So just the movies, not the books. All right. Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to do even worse. Quiz me. Go. Okay. So listeners, I'm going to give you two of the questions oh my God. that I'm going to actually ask that are in the Harry Potter trivia night. I love this. So if you're in Edmonton, you need to go and use this insider knowledge. Exactly. And I'm going to make them real hard. Okay, I'm going to ask you two questions from the tiebreaker round because these are supposed to be the hardest ones. Fuck. Okay. Question the first. The Gryffindor common room is decorated with tapestry replicas from which medieval collection? It's the one, it's the classic one that has the unicorns in it. Mm -hmm. It's like a really famous set of medieval tapestries that depict unicorns, but I can't remember the name of them. Can you give me the first letter? I'll give you the first word. Uh Uh-huh. The. (laughs) Fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) And the word unicorn does appear in the title. Oh my god. Oh, I know these. Like, I can see them. I could sketch them for you. I don't remember the name. This is the pleasure of trivia when you're like, ah! <laughs> The answer is the lady and the unicorn. Ah, oh, the lady and the unicorn. It's so <laughs> famous. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go just give us this look like you nerds. I uh, went to see them when I was in Paris oh uh, many years ago. They are quite cool. Okay. What is the name of the dog who plays Fang in the first two movies? That's got to be a trick question. There's a bunch of dogs. Fang was played by like five dogs. But only one dog in the first two or three movies. Okay, well, I saw photos of all of these dogs when I visited the studio tour outside of London. Um, I have no clue, so I'm going to say Gretchen. You know what? You're in the right family of names. It's Hugo. Hugo? Incredible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Those were great questions. I didn't know the answers to either of them, and that's how you know they're good, because I'm really <laughs> bad at trivia. <laughs> okay, well, that was really fun. Thanks, everybody. Doing trivia at a bar is fun because you get to be anonymous and no one needs to know your score unless you win. Well, we're not anonymous here, and so let's make sure we've read back through our notes so as not to embarrass ourselves in front of our guest. That's right. It's time for revision. Marcel, what are we revising today? Well, Hannah, we're going to be talking about religion and theology and the soul. So we should probably, I mean, oh shit, Hannah, I don't know if we've ever even gotten close to this topic before. I don't think we have. (laughs) I went through our old episodes to find ones that we could connect and I was like, well, I guess this isn't a strength of ours. I mean, (laughs) I guess... Hauntology encouraged us to think a little bit about the nature of ghosts. Mm -hmm. Are ghosts souls? 
I, we're going to need our guests to answer that. Um, we could maybe look back to our first episode where we talked about the monomyth because we can kind of think of the hero's journey as a metaphor for, you know, life, death, and rebirth. But the stretch. I, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, let's focus instead on what we already know about the concept of the soul from the books. Okay, great. So it's established relatively early on that souls are a thing in this world. Yes. I think we first hear about them because we find out that Dementors can eat them. <laughs> no, we find Quirrell. We find out about souls because of Quirrell, because a bit of Voldemort's soul is living in Quirrell, and then he tries to go into Harry, and then Dumbledore's like, he can't be in your body because your soul's too nice. We hear about souls in the first book. And then we find out that Dementors can eat them. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so first you find out you have them, and then you find out that they're edible, and it's ooh, icky. So they're edible. That's a thing we know about souls. Ingestible. <laughs> mm -hmm. or, or destructible. It isn't clear what happens to them after the Dementor eats them. Yeah. Even with Horcrux making, you can split your soul into parts magically via a, an act of great evil, which apparently is only murder in the books. Yeah, murder, murder or mail fraud. Actually, they don't mention that, but that's the other mail one. Mail fraud. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Don't. Don't open someone else's mail. Yeah. Your and we've soul got shattered. We've got ghosts, but mm -hmm. nearly headless Nick makes it pretty clear to us that they're not the same as people, like not really souls. They're like an imprint, right? He says they're a pale imitation of the person they were when alive, not unlike the echo of the person who emerges from the priori incantatum spell, which is also not the actual soul of the person, but like a memory of them. So the souls of those people haven't been trapped in Voldemort's wand this whole time. No, but the but the the memory or imprint of them that is trapped in the wand can make requests, like when Cedric asks Harry to take his body back to his parents. So they're they're ghost like in that sense. Ghost like, but not souls. Not souls. Not souls. Okay, so souls exist. And bad things can hurt them, but there doesn't seem to be any concept of heaven or hell or organized religion in the wizarding world. They do live in a Christian universe because they celebrate Christmas and Halloween. <laughs> Famous, famously part of the Christian theological calendar. Is it not? No. They don't have Halloween in places that aren't Christian. Okay, we'll ask Matt later. <laughs> they are in this sort of, like, Christian holiday cycle. Yes, but it doesn't seem to be uh, for religious purposes, just for convenient decoration purposes. Yeah, it seems to be primarily aesthetic. They don't, there's no church. Nobody goes to a temple of any variety. Uh-uh. But there is a sense of ethics and values and ethical values with like real spiritual implications. Yeah, like there is something approaching a theological understanding of the soul. I'm already talking. I'm already <laughs> talking on my ass. I have no idea. I really don't know. There's a thing called a soul and things happen to it. And those things happen to it for reasons. Yeah, they talk about good and evil, right? Like they use the word evil in the books. But what's that? I'm willing to argue that it's a social construct. Let's find out. These are all these are all really good questions. Yeah, let's take these questions on over to our guest and find out what he has to say. You know, if you think about it, education is kind of like a long and detailed prep session for a trivia night. So why don't we do some specialized learning in transfiguration class? <laughs> I'm going to start reframing humanity's education as a way to get good at trivia. That's how we're going <laughs> to save the humanities. <laughs> what can you do with an English degree? Well, you can do trivia. <laughs> Hannah, would you be so kind as to introduce our special guest. Matthew Potts grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and graduated from Notre Dame with a BA in English. After a brief stint in the Navy in Japan, he began graduate school and took both his Master of Divinity and PhD degrees from Harvard. 
He serves on the Harvard faculty now and teaches courses on religion and literature. He's also an Episcopal priest and has ministered to several congregations in Massachusetts. Currently, he is the minister of Harvard's University Church. Matt is the co-host of Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. He likes running, cooking, walking his dog, the Detroit Tigers, either a sports team or an animal, unclear, dessert, and doing nearly anything with his wife and kids. He also likes a lot of books. Matt, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Welcome, Matt. Sorry, I don't know how to say Episcopal or Congregation. That's okay. And I don't know what a Detroit Tiger is. There's no Episcopal Church in Canada. <laughs> Up there, we're the, the Anglican Church of Canada. Episcopal is just Anglican? Episcopal is just Anglican. Get the front door. Because during the Revolutionary War down here, we didn't want to call anything English. So we changed our name. Oh, that's funny. From Anglican to Episcopal. Wow. Do you have the United Church in the States or is that a Canadian thing? That's a Canadian thing. But we have similar. We have the United Church of Christ, which is similar. But yeah. What? Yeah. And the Detroit Tigers are a baseball team named not after the animal. What? During the Civil War, the Detroit kind of regiment that went down and fought in the South was known as the Tigers. And so the baseball team named themselves after this volunteer regiment that fought during the Civil War. But the regiment was named after the But the, the regiment animals, was named right? after the animals. So indirectly. <laughs> yeah, right. They, they didn't just come up with tigers. <laughs> right? yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's amazing. They just, like, came up with the term. <laughs> no, that's right. Matt, I have to tell you that I did my undergrad at McGill, and um, I was just thinking about this the other day. McGill doesn't sell these, but there's some industrious entrepreneur who, at least when I was there, used to sell these t-shirts and sweatshirts in front of McGill campus that said, Harvard, and then in really tiny letters underneath, America's McGill. And they were <laughs> extremely popular among McGill students. I didn't buy one, but... I think about it all the time. I'm from Michigan. And at the University of Michigan, they sell blue and maize shirts that say Harvard. And underneath it says the Michigan of the East. <laughs> but my favorite one that I've seen is one in Atlanta, which says Harvard, the white Morehouse. <laughs> 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 that's really yeah, good. I like, that's my favorite. That's the good one. Everybody just yakking on Harvard. <laughs> okay. Well, wow. So, Matt, we've... We've invited you here not only to just shoot the shit, poke fun at Harvard, <laughs> um, but also because perhaps as the revision section demonstrated, our grounding in theology and religious studies is maybe not as strong as it could be. And so we are hoping you could give us a little bit of an introduction to the field. I'd be happy to. I, I mean, lots of things that you were talking about in the revision that I would like to touch upon. The, the Christian nature of Halloween, first of all. Yeah, why don't we actually start there? Am I wrong? Because Jews have Purim, not Halloween. Yeah, so Halloween is, it's, it's short for All Hallows' Eve. It's All Saints' Day is November 1st, so October 31st is All Hallows' Eve, right? But the 2nd of November is All Souls' Day. The first of November is All Saints Day, so I'm tying I'm tying it in. See? You're very good at this. It relates a little bit. Oh, what a segue. You're a pro. <laughs> so <laughs> should I tell you a bit about religious studies first or or theology? Yes, please. Yeah, what's the difference? Can you tell us what the difference is? Some people say it's an insurmountable difference. Other folks say that theology can be housed within religious studies. And other folks say that religious studies is housed within theology, right? It sort of depends upon where your starting point is. Mm -hmm. For me, the most capacious term is religious studies or the study of religion. I, th this is the weird thing about this field. At Harvard, we call it the study of religion, not religious studies, because we don't want to give the implication that our study is religious, that we are a bunch of religious folks no. who are trying to study, right? We call it the study of religion because that's really the way that the field is conceived in the academy. So religious studies doesn't really have its own methodology. It brings to bear the methodology of other disciplines upon a particular object of study, which is religion. Right. In the Committee on the Study of Religion here at Harvard, we have sociologists, we have host historians, we have anthropologists, we have philosophers, we have ethicists who are all using the methodologies from their various fields in order to explore or, ex or study this thing called religion. Now, another group of people that are part of religious studies are theologians. And theologians can be understood lots of different ways. Sometimes theologians are, are folks who, who squarely situate themselves within a confessional body and say, like, we are starting with these basic confessional commitments. What's a confessional body? Yeah, like a church. A church, right? Okay. <laughs> a church or, you know, like a, a Jewish theologian would squarely situate themselves within the Jewish tradition and say that we are making some faith claims as starting points. God exists. 
they don't make any apology for those initial faith claims, but then they use other methods from the study of religion, like the study of history, or even anthropology, ethnography, in order to kind of dig deeper into into these questions. Myself, I would identify, I, I mean, disciplinarily identify a couple of different ways. So like you might say that I'm a, I study religion and literature because religion and literature is a subfield within the study of religion, which looks at the way that religion and literature overlap. You could also call me a theologian of the constructive variety. I'm a constructive theologian. Ooh, what does that mean? That's going to be our <laughs> only follow-up question in this section. What does that mean? <laughs> so constructive theology is a branch of theology, which is different from dogmatic theology is like, okay, what are our fundamental beliefs and that kind of thing. Constructive theology kind of takes for granted something that, you know, I get this out of my prior study in literature because I did my undergrad and graduate study, my earlier graduate study in literature. Constructive theology takes for granted that the meanings of concepts shift over time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm excited. (laughs) Yeah, so something you read in the New Testament, like if I read something in the New Testament, this is a 2,000-year-old document or set of documents that were written in a different culture, in a different language, and have been translated. And so if you read the word, say, forgiveness or spirit in the New Testament, like, how do we actually talk about what that means for us now? A constructive theologian would say, okay, first we have to do some history. Because what did it mean to the people who were dealing with it, right? What, what did that word mean to them? What was the history that they were dealing with? How was this word used in the scriptures that they were looking at? What ways were they trying to stretch the meaning of it and shift the meaning of it? How has that meaning shifted over time? And then a constructive theologian like me would get to the current moment and say like, okay, what is usable now? Like if I want to think about the soul now, given everything else I know about the world and my other engagements with other disciplines, what can I lift up from the tradition that can still bear some semantic weight now, that can still be meaningful to me or others? Or how do I need to stretch this definition, redefine it, reconstruct it so that it can be meaningful going forward, right? And that's actually something I think is going to happen with the soul, because when we talk about the soul, I think what we'll see is that the words that are translated into English as soul from the Hebrew Bible and from the New Testament meant something very different than what it came to mean even two or three centuries later, which is also very different than, I think, what it means for somebody like me now. So you can see the meaning of it shifting. And a constructive theologian, I think, is kind of excited about that shift and excited about trying to redeploy this language so it can be meaningful and useful to people in the present and the future. Okay, Matt, this is very exciting. Okay, good. (laughs) I'm going to backtrack a teeny bit because it sounds a lot like these two fields, the study of religion and the study of literature, that they're very similar, right? Like they both draw from other disciplines in order to take these methodologies and understand text and understand the meaning of text and how it has shifted over time. So can you talk to us a little bit about what specifically distinguishes religious studies from the study of secular texts? That's a really good question because a lot of what I do actually is look at secular texts. So my first book is on the fiction of a novelist named Cormac McCarthy, an American novelist named Cormac McCarthy. We have him here. Yeah, you know, what I try to do is I try to like look at how religious imagery, religious ideas operate in his in his fiction and also how his fiction pushes back on the weak points of that theology of those religious images, right? And so and so I think about them together. The the a book that I have coming out this year is on the question of forgiveness. And it looks at the how the topic of forgiveness has shifted over time within Christian history, but it also looks at contemporary fiction, contemporary novels to see how forgiveness is deployed in those fictions and see how those fictions can push back against religion tradition against the religious tradition and and so we can see how meaning is shifting. So for somebody like me who studies religion and literature and who approaches theology in this very constructive way, the line between religious study or the study of religion and the study of literature is very, very blurry because I'm looking at literary texts with an eye towards what they're saying about how we should live, what what does it mean to forgive, what, how do we how do we forgive well, what are the dangers of it, all these things, right? And I'm also trying to discern, you know, the Christian culture has been hugely formative in the West, and so it's it's hard for anybody, whatever their particular kind of personal dispositions are, to say a word like like soul or forgiveness without just carrying on, like pulling forth a lot of baggage from the tradition that I just kind of want to pick apart and see what's going on there and see how we can use it again. I mean, the thing that the study of religion also does is, you know, it it will study ritual. It it studies material artifacts. It looks at architecture. It looks at other things, right? But, you know, often people who study sacred architecture, at some places you might see them in art history departments, and at other places you might see them in religious studies departments, again, because that boundary is fairly blurry. Okay, team. So let's talk about the soul. 
Matt, can you take us through what do we know? We're dealing with a soul in these books. We're going to talk about how the soul functions in the books in the next segment. But for now, like, what is the information that we can assume that we should have at our fingertips before we start unpacking what the heck the soul means in the Harry Potter books. So this is really interesting. I mean, this kind of goes to the thing that we were just talking, not that I'm going to make us talk about disciplinarity again, but this goes to the, this goes to exactly what we were talking about, because the idea of the soul itself comes out of a Western, kind of a Western tradition, right? I mean, my mother is from Japan, and so I have a lot of Buddhism in my family. And the soul is not a concept that translates easily into Japanese culture or into Buddhist religion, right? There are notions of consciousness, there's a notion of the self, but that's subtly different than what is at stake in the notion of soul. So one of the things that, you know, when you invited me to come talk about the soul that I wanted to look at was the ways in which the soul has been conceived by Western religion over the past, you know, few thousand years, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just sum up a few thousand years for us. This is going to be kind of provocative. Ooh. I think what I would say, at least for, for, for people who read the Bible, I don't think there's a strong conception of the soul anywhere in the Bible, at least not in the contemporary sense. The Bible does not really talk about the soul or the soul that we tend to talk about it, or even maybe that the Harry Potter series talks about it at all, I think, certainly not in the Hebrew Bible. It maybe is starting to a little bit in the New Testament, but I'm not sure that that, that it is. And going back to something you said during revision, in the Hebrew Bible, there's not even a very clear or strong sense of any afterlife. There was one that's beginning to develop in the New Testament, but there's no place for the soul to go necessarily in the Hebrew Bible after death, right? So that's that's a provocative thing I want to say. The, the word that is translated as soul in the Hebrew Bible is a Hebrew word, nefesh, which doesn't mean like what, what I think we mean when we talk about soul, like a kind of permanent, potentially disembodied, unchanging, immortal part of the self that lives on beyond the body. Nefesh just means like a living being, like a life force. So in the creation account in Genesis, you know, there's a bunch of dust and God forms the human out of dust. And then God breathes upon the dust. And when God breathes upon the dust, the dust becomes a nefesh, a living being. It's not like the breath goes into the dust and the dust becomes like the uniform for the actually animate breath. It's not like the breath is the real thing and the dust is still just, still just material that is adorning the life force. Rather, the dust is made living, right? It is given life force and it becomes a living being. So all kinds of things in the Hebrew Bible, especially in the creation account, are described as nefesh, right? So like animals and other kinds of creatures, plants are not usually described this way, but all kinds of things are living beings in this sense, which have been given the breath of life. As we discussed it in our hauntology episode, it's not like a ghost riding a body <laughs> around like a mech suit. No, it is not. It's like the quality of livingness. The quality of livingness is a great way to put it, right? Sorry, but but like livingness with the consciousness. I'm not an expert in ancient Israelite scientific discourse. I'm not sure how they would have described it. Yeah. <laughs> well, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, right. But I think I think that's right. There is something about, and I mean, the, the word animate comes from the Latin word for soul, an, anima, right? So like there is something about something being animate, right? Like plants are not. They're not animate in the same way that other creatures are, that animals are, that that humans are. And a lot of those things... Oh, my which, God. They're called animals. They're called animals. A lot of those things, right. They <laughs> they are understood to be nefesh, right? According to the Hebrew Bible. I'm mad at language right now. <laughs> oh, my God. Basically, the ancient Israelite religion is, you know, the ancient kingdoms of Israel were conquered first by, by, other, by other empires, right? And so Persian religion deeply influences Israelite religion. And then... You know, Alexander the Great conquers everything. And then Greek religion deeply influences everything. Yeah, it's where we get epispasm. Where we get what? Excuse me? <laughs> Cause <I'm tight>. yeah. <laughs> the only things I actually studied a lot of religion of my undergraduate. Yeah, and I've obviously forgotten all of it, including I did a semester of theology at the University of Edinburgh. There you go. Like I should <laughs> remember this shit better. I did a whole course on medieval Christology, just gone. It's gone. What I remember is epispasm. I don't know what that is. Which was a surgical reversal of circumcision that was practiced by Jewish men in Hellenic. Oh, okay. Ancient Israel as part of a desire to participate in wrestling culture. Ah. <laughs> anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. It's actually a super telling example, right? Because what happens is like Hellenic culture comes to dominate the ancient Near East, right? The Hebrew Bible is translated into a Greek version, which is called the Septuagint. 
Uh, that's the name for the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. And most people who identified at the time as Judean or descendants of the Israelites or who looked at these scriptures spoke Greek and were reading versions of the Hebrew Bible, which were in Greek. Mm. And the word that is tra- that nefesh is translated to into in Greek is psyche or psyche. Okay. And what does psyche mean? Psyche means soul. <laughs> Right. Damn it. Okay. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> this is this is the most we've ever sworn at a guest. I don't. I'm know sorry. What's going I'm, I'm irritating you so much. No, but, so, not at all. Psyche is obviously. I mean, you, you know, psyche, right? Psyche is where we get the word psychiatry or psychology from. Mm-hmm. Like the mind. Like the mind, right? I wouldn't have necessarily aligned the mind with the soul, and I feel like that's exactly. I thought they were different things. Yeah. Aren't they? Well, I, I mean, it, this is the, this is why constructive theology is so interesting, <laughs> right? Because in the Hebrew Bible, like there was no sense of soul as, as we have in English. There was just alive. Is this thing living? Oh, it's living. Great. And then it's dead. And there's no heaven or hell. Then Greek comes in, and we have this concept of the psyche. And Greek religion does have an idea that there is an immortal soul, which does survive death. And does carry on into immortality, right? And psyche is associated, is that thing which carries on after death. Oh, yeah, because the Greeks have, like, hell. Hades. They have Hades, right. And souls, and souls that you can go back and retrieve. Exactly, that's right. And also, they had the the form of Greek religion. I mean, there was lots of Greek religion, so this is very reductive, right? But the forms of Greek religion that were operating at the time in the New Testament, the dominant forms at the time in the New Testament and in a couple centuries afterwards— based upon certain forms of Platonism, like Plato, right? And some of these forms became known as Gnosticism. Some Maybe you've heard of Gnosticism. But in Gnosticism, there is this rivalry between the spiritual and the material world. That's what the Matrix is about. There you go. <laughs> right? The spiritual world is the good and pure world, and material is evil. And in Gnosticism and in certain forms of Platonic religion, material life and flesh is understood as like a prison. There's this idea that there's this evil sub-creator below the good creator. Like we were, when we were created by the good creator, by the one, we were just these happy spirits floating around. And then this sub-god called the Demiurge created matter to imprison us in our fleshly bodies. Your body is a cage. My body is a cage. And so what it means to be saved is to escape your body And get out of the prison of flesh and have your spirit released into eternity to return to the one. So you can see here how the soul is starting to be understood as spiritual. Mm -hmm. At the time of the New Testament, the word for spirit was pneuma or pneuma, pneumatic. Yep, like a pneumatic tube. Pneumatic tubes. That's also derived from the word for breath because it's air, basically. Oh, my God. We're having a lot of fun with etymology here today. Fun with etymology. That's right. So at the time in the New Testament, they were talking about the spirit and the soul. When Paul, the the Apostle Paul, is writing all his letters in the New Testament, he uses the language of soul and spirit, psyche and pneuma, kind of interchangeably, right? I mean, there's a lot of debate among scholars how interchangeably, but you can see that he sees them as really related. But this kind of the the big revolutionary thing that was going on with Jesus, or at least the thing that they thought was revolutionary at the time. I mean, he he was a body. He was a body. That's like his whole thing. That's his whole thing, which is why the resurrection of the body became really important. Because what early Christians were saying was that if there was going to be eternal life, then our material bodies had to also live forever. Because if our material bodies didn't live forever, that would either mean that that our immaterial souls did, which would make the immaterial soul superior to the body and the body inferior in some way. And so the soul is good and the body is bad. It would revert to this kind of Gnosticism they're trying to resist. Or if the body didn't rise at all and the soul is part of the body, then that just means there's no immortality. You die and it's all over, right? So the, the early Christians were not willing to do either thing. They wanted to say there was eternal life, but they also wanted to say that flesh and body are good and holy. And if there's immortal life and flesh and body are good and holy, then flesh and body must be itself immortal. Not a thing we escape, our spirits escape, but itself itself holy and pointed towards eternity. But we know that the body decomposes. Yeah, what, what, what about the fact that we're made out of meat? This is one of the challenges that I have about whether it's theory or whether it's religion. I'm stuck in the material world. I'm a material girl. And I just want to know, 
how do these thinkers account for the fact that they, I mean, they must know yeah. they're surrounded by death all the time. People lived until they were 30. So they know that the that people die and that the body will decay. I mean, I think that religious folks are capable of believing some pretty outlandish things and pretty difficult to believe things, right? I mean, there are passages in the Hebrew Bible where the breath of God passes over this valley of dry bones and they grow sinew and tendons and flesh and then rise again into new bodies, right? I think that there's there's a miracle, a miraculous kind of belief going on here. But there was also the case in early Christian life that this is why in Christian culture, in many cases, whole bodies are buried rather than being cremated, right? Because it's going to be a lot harder for God to get me resurrected if I'm a bunch of dust scattered over the ocean or whatever, rather than if I'm a body under the earth. And God is busy. I know. God, God doesn't have time to do all this, right? Exactly. Because that that is a thing in Judaism, right? That you are supposed to be buried whole so that when the Messiah comes and all of the bodies are resurrected, you have all your parts. Right. People knew that there was decomposition, Right. But I think to me, and this is now I'm speaking as a constructive theologian, because I'm like you. You're a material girl in a material world. That's right. And I understand that bodies decompose. And I don't actually think that this claim that early Christianity makes about the resurrection of the body means that it's going to be like zombie land and people are going to be arising from tombs and walking around. Although there was some version of that in some early Christian thought. But what I do really want to hold on to as a constructive theologian is this absolute insistence on the holiness of the material. Because here's what happens in Christian history, right? So you see in he Hebrew Bible, nefesh, living being. And then Hebrew Bible gets translated into Greek and becomes like thoroughly embedded into Greek culture. And then Greek religion and this idea of the body as a container for, as a meat suit for the spirit. The body is something the spirit needs to escape in order to find salvation becomes really, really important and becomes super important in early Christian thought. Most of the early Christian theologians and most influential early Christian theologians, this guy named Origen in particular, were trained in Greek, in Greek thought, and they made a strong case for the spirit having to escape the body. And then you see approximately 1,700 years of Christian thought and practice demonizing human bodies and condemning the flesh. Now, that language is in Paul in the New Testament, but Paul is struggling with it. He says stuff like, oh, we, we will put off our fleshly bodies, but we'll still have a body because we have to have a body because bodies have made been holy, have been made holy by Jesus. And it'll just be like a spiritual body, a pneuma. Remember that word, pneuma body, right? But then pneuma is this is like a different translation of that original nefesh, which is breath, right? And so it's it's a circular kind of thing. He's talking back on himself. You can see Paul struggling with it. But by the time you get to like 400, 700, 1,000 years later, then the rhetoric coming out of the Christian West is very much your body is something to escape. My body is a cage. Your body is a source of temptation and evil, and something has to be triumphed over. And what was so important to the early Christian communities about sanctifying the body, calling the flesh holy, gets flipped upside down into like the Christian tradition condemning flesh and condemning condemning the body. Hmm. Is that is part of that because sort of as the church develops, Greek philosophy continues to be so central to theological thought? I think that's right. I think that's right. Hellenic thought and then in the Christian West, Latinate theology, Latin theology becomes dominant, right? And that has a, that's strongly influenced by Greek thought, but also has its own sort of, ha has a similar kind of normative framework, I guess, right? And carries that tradition forward. And then if I'm just being cynical, but I don't think I'm being unduly cynical, I think that if you are a very powerful institution, like the church became in the fourth century, and you want to get in the business of disciplining bodies, well... Oh, hell yes. Okay. Yeah, here's some ways, <laughs> right? G guess what? If you, mm -hmm, build, yeah. if you build a cosmological system around the disciplining of human bodies, then that, that gets you a long way towards your goal, right? And then you can create a hierarchy where some bodies are worse Absolutely. than other bodies. So you can say, like, actually, women are a lot more embodied, so they're bad, worse, they're worse. Absolutely, right? You can come up with a whole list of things that you do with your body that are bad and then come up with a way of taxing the things that you do with your body so that you can fundraise more yeah. effectively. It is effect. It was extremely effective fundraising, I gotta say. And all these things, right? Like as soon as you develop like a whole mode of discourse whereby you can condemn the flesh because we're flesh, because we're material girls in a material world. 
if you're in control of that discourse, you get to decide whatever you want to condemn. And it's there for you. Which for a person, a constructive theologian like me, I'm like, shit, that's exactly the opposite. <laughs> That's exactly the opposite of what I want to say Jesus was up to, which was Jesus, was, I think, was doing the opposite, which is like, no, instead of condemning everything, consecrate everything. Instead of seeing the body mm. as infinitely and eminently condemnable, see it as good and holy. And then and then turn to folks and instead of instead of this, these endless opportunities to alienate and demonize others, what you have are endless opportunities to celebrate and, and sanctify others. Right. I may not be a Christian, but I have read the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that there is plenty of textual evidence that that dude loved sex workers, was <laughs> super down with washing feet. That's not somebody who thinks the body's unclean. Absolutely not. That's right. That's right. The, the other thing I want to think about with in terms of soul. So this is a lot of like Christian history, but one place where the idea of the soul is actually being used in really interesting ways in contemporary in the contemporary study of religion and in contemporary Christian thought is in black theology and in African-American religions. So there's this uh, very interesting scholar named Terrence Johnson at Georgetown University, and he has a book called Tragic Soul Life, which is a study of the thought of W.E.B. Du Bois. And he wants to think about the term soul, but he's not thinking about the term soul in the kind of quote unquote classic sense of as sort of like the immortal spirit that survives my death once I have sloughed off my mortal coil and ascended into the heavens, right? He is I think he's also, from my own sense of, of reading his work, he's also a material girl living in a material world. And he's he's not trying to make a strong claim about the sort of eternal whereabouts of human selfhoods or identities or consciousnesses. What he's trying to do instead is think about black life in white supremacist culture and in colonial culture, right? And trying to think about what the way he talks about tragic soul life is he looks at the African-American religious experience in particular, but the African-American experience generally and says, what is the soul for these folks, right? And he says he wants to hold on to some of the kind of the sense of immortality around the soul by saying, here we have, you know, a people, the culture that surrounds them tries to destroy them. In spite of the fact that the culture around them is doing its level best to destroy them, they sh exhibit this resilience. They turn inward because if they turn outward and turn to the outward world, they say the outward world hates them. And so there is an interiority within black life. There is an inwardness within black life, which is where the soul resides. And in that inward space, folks find the resilience to survive and to thrive despite everything that's around them. That part of the self which is resilient, which can face the tragic reality of the world around them and still choose to live and still choose to strive and still through, choose to struggle. That is what he wants to call soul. It's the kind of thing that can't be killed by white supremacy, even though individuals can be killed, obviously, by white supremacy. This, this part of the life of Black people in America and elsewhere is what he wants to call soul. And he sees it showing up in places like black art and black preaching and in jazz and in black literature and black music. So soul becomes, to me, I don't know if he would say this, but to me, this is a constructive theological move too, right? Because he's saying, you know, I don't need it to be what it was in the third century. I don't need it to be what it was for Origen, the theologian in ancient Alexandria, right? What it is for the people that I'm looking at, there is something that resists violence and resists the pain that is visited upon these bodies. There is something inside the body that can bear that and resist it and endure it and live on even after individuals have died. And that I'm going to call tragic soul life, right? But he, so he's playing with W.E.B. Du Bois's work on the souls of Black folk, um, but he's also really trying to describe, you know, what's at stake in saying, even though we are material, there is something inward inside us. There is something resilient inside mm -hmm. us. And there is something that does struggle against death and maybe even survive death, if not in sort of the afterlife version that that we might inherit from our Christian tradition. Yeah. And something both sort of survives the violence done to the body without suggesting that the violence being done to the body is fine because the body doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Because what he I mean, what he wants to say is like, if you look at, you know, look at jazz or look at the civil rights movement or look at any number of cultural and, and spiritual practices in the black community, you have to say, like, where does hope come from? Where does resilience come from? Where does the struggle come from? It comes from somewhere inside. There is something inside that is giving rise to this life, giving rise to this resistance. And that, yeah, that's what he wants to say. OK, we need a name for this. And so 
soul is a good name for this, right? But he wants to be realistic about it, which is why he calls it tragic soul life. Because it's not just like, oh, we, oh, it's going to be fine now and everything will ascend to some sweet hereafter. It's still, the stakes are still terrible and, and costly. But the resistance and the endurance and the hope and the, and the life is still there. I'm so interested in how that framing of the soul lets us read Voldemort as a figure of white supremacy. I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves because that's the next section. But that immediately made something about the book really click hmm, for me. Nice. So I know we're going to talk at length about the soul in Harry Potter. But before we do that, because we've just we've covered so much thrilling and exciting history. And I just I just think it might be helpful to just do a quick Cliff's Notes slash Cole's Notes slash for the Gen Z Spark Notes of what is the dominant cultural Western understanding of the soul that we should have in mind when we look at the Harry Potter books today? I think that's a great question. Yeah. And I'm not super comfortable speaking for for what Western culture thinks. But I think... Speak for that, all of Western culture, yeah, please, I, I, now. But I will speak Thank for you. all of Western culture. I, I mean, I think that that the version of the soul that is operative in the Harry Potter books and is operative in conventional wisdom today, when people mean soul, I think they tend to mean something like the immortal, undying part of the self, which is not lost at death. And there's different opinions upon where it came from before, like before birth. But... I think when people talk about the soul, what they mean is something interior to the body or to the self, which persists beyond the death of the body and the corruption and the and the decomposition of the body. I think that's what's meant here. I mean, as you may have understood from everything I said so far, I think that's a concept which is fairly exhausted and doesn't is not super useful. Um, and I'm really interested in ways to rethink what the soul is. But I'm also interested in ways that like Harry Potter, even if it I mean, this is what I do with literature, too. Like, Harry Potter and the series can inherit that idea, but also, like, work on it and shift it so it comes out the other end different and maybe more usable for those of us who are reading the books. So, Well, speaking of working on it, let's go work on this book. If education is basically just preparing for trivia, then exams are basically just high-stakes trivia nights that take place during the day. Let's show you what we mean in OWLs. Why don't we start by just going back to a few of those, like, understandings of the soul in the book that we introduced in revision and, like, talk through those in light of what we now understand. Some textual evidence to set us up. A soul can be eaten. Well, to me, what's interesting about this is that is that the soul in Harry Potter can be destroyed. Because there isn't an implication. It's not like the Dementors kiss, you then go through the veil. Like, it's it's treated as being something, a fate worse than death. Yes. Which suggests that, that yeah, it's not, it's not ju- you're just dying. It's that your soul is getting destroyed. Right. Because Christian conceptions of the afterlife, where there is a hell and a heaven, kind of depend upon the fact that there will be souls there forever that can't be destroyed, right? But I think that you're right. I think if soul can be eaten or consumed, it is undone or destroyed or eradicated or transformed in some fundamental way. And also we see this with with the Horcruxes, right? Isn't isn't Voldemort's soul destroyed by being broken apart over and over again, being divided over and over again? Yeah, it's it's fragmented too many times. Yeah, it's not destroyed in the same way that your soul is destroyed when it's eaten by a dementor. Though again, we don't actually know I don't think anybody knows if that soul does go anywhere, but it it seems it seems like it's destroyed. Whereas what Voldemort has done is irreparably fragment and damage his soul such that um he's like broken so many pieces off of it that the soul that remains in his body is one that is insufficiently robust to take him through to the afterlife. Yeah. So right. spoiler, he gets trapped eternally in limbo. That was so that, that was I didn't know if we were allowed to talk about book 7 because King's Cross, that's the thing, right? We this this is this is Voldemort's soul which is is not destroyed, you're right, because it's still there. It's not it hasn't been annihilated. It's there. It's but it's so deeply deeply corrupted and and compromised. Okay, so because we got because we slipped into book 7, I have a suggestion. I suggest that we reframe the questions about about the soul 
because what we know so far, according to the books, is that it can be eaten by dementors. We know that the soul can be fragmented through a terrible act of evil, namely murder. And we know that it can be fragmented multiple times, but as far as we are aware, Voldemort is the only one who has fragmented his soul into seven parts. And then put it can be put into things. I mean, one of the things I think is interesting about this question is that, I mean, early Christian thought would say you can't put a portion of your soul into something that's not your body because your body carries your soul. I mean, that's, that's like they're tied to get like the soul is material in that sense. So th this idea of the soul as potentially becoming fragmented or of Voldemort being able to deposit portions of his soul in objects or other animals means kind of definitionally that the soul is separable from his physical body, which is not the traditional understanding of what the soul is, although it is kind of the contemporary understanding of what the soul is. One of the things I like about, I mean, I don't like the Dementor's Kiss, but one of the things I think is interesting about the Dementor's Kiss is that if you think about it, it's almost the reverse of that creation moment in Genesis. Holy shit. Where you have dust, which is inanimate, and then God breathes into it, and then it is made a living thing. Not because a soul was put into it, the, the dust itself is given life, right? And this is kind of the, the reverse is happening here. This stuff which is material is still material afterwards, but through sucking out the breath of life, Right, it becomes inanimate material. They suck the livingness. They suck out the of livingness you. out. Right. In some ways, that's a more orthodox understanding of what the soul is than anything that that Voldemort's doing. And that does, I think, shed light on how I think metaphorically we ultimately need to read Voldemort's fragmentation of his soul. I think in part because it just makes no sense. <laughs> it just it just doesn't make any sense according to any theological system I have heard that the soul is like a large cookie that you can break into pieces to share with various people. Soul cookies. Delicious. I think one way we might think about what's going on with Voldemort or his great evil and great crime and how it relates to the soul might be usefully framed or informed by some of the stuff I was saying about W.E.B. Du Bois and black theology and black thought, especially in face of, of white supremacy, because what's important about the way Terrence Johnson reads Tragic Soul Life is that tragic soul life in the black experience does not deny the reality of death because it can't deny the reality of death. What it does is it resists the reality of death with this inward kind of strength, right? And another person who, you know, who is deeply influenced by Du Bois and who influences Johnson is James Baldwin. And in The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin writes that the great sin of white people is that they deny their own death. And so they don't have to face their own death. They project death upon others, right? And that is precisely what characterizes Voldemort. Exactly. Is that right from the beginning, he is defined as being a character who is so afraid of death that he is willing to go to unspeakable levels of violence mm -hmm. against others, mm -hmm. right? Like he does damage to his soul, but he does damage to his soul as a side effect of the horrors that he perpetuates on others out of a desire to indefinitely delay his own death. Right. Which is why I think that sort of treating it a bit more metaphorically, I mean, I always want to treat things metaphorically, but treating it a bit more metaphorically here and saying like, that ultimately the sort of the subdivision of the soul has less to do with the material reality of what the soul is and more to do with the material reality of what Voldemort is doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because because what Johnson and Baldwin would say is that the soul in the black experience, the soul is the the inward strength that faces death, but refuses to project it upon others. And so Voldemort and facing death and turning away from it and choosing to project it upon others rather than face it is actually losing his soul, right? It By that definition mm -hmm, of soul, it mm -hmm. is him losing his soul, destroying his own soul or incapacitating his soul so that it cannot face transitions that it needs to face, right? Yeah, and that, that fantasy that the soul, that the quality of livingness that is what makes you human can be not only abstracted from your body but put into inanimate, uncorruptible objects does, again, sort of suggest that, like, what's key about the Horcruxes is the way that they are entangled in this fantasy of immortality and the extremes that someone is willing to go to to achieve immortality, if that's what they decide the goal is. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that this helps us get to one of the other questions that, you know, we come back to a lot in the podcast, which is like where Voldemort's evil comes from, right? Like we've talked about it in the past, arguing about whether or not the books imply that he was evil because of his conception or he was evil because he was raised in an orphanage. Can I add a note about that before you finish that? Because somebody on Twitter gave me the origin of that theory. Oh. Which is rolling. It's not textual, but she has said in multiple other sources Mm -hmm. that the reason why Voldemort is evil is because he was conceived under the power of a love spell, which is a truly horrifying proposition that suggests that a child conceived in uh, in an act of sexual violence is born evil which is just i think we can all just get on board with that being garbage and also there's no textual evidence of it because it's a it's a paratextual claim that rowling has made and her paratextual claims suck (laughs) they do if we're thinking of this as a kind of allegory or or metaphor or in some kind of, of relationship with the idea of white supremacy, in particular, like white violence against black bodies, is the way in which white children who grow up under white supremacy may start out innocent, but gradually over time become indoctrinated into white supremacy such that it becomes normal to them, right? So like, I'm thinking of Octavia Butler's Kindred where she has this this relationship with her ancestor when she goes back in time. And he starts out as a child, and she's thinking, like, maybe I can develop a relationship with him so that he will not become a violent, enslaving monster. But then he does, irrespective of their relationship. And so... Oh, this is a very long-winded... It's absolutely amazing because grammatically it's been a single sentence. <laughs> and I don't know how you've managed to hold all of these subclauses in your head. It's you're very really, hard. You're kind it of hurts. blowing my mind. You're kind of blowing my mind here right now. I'm but so physically uncomfortable. It does suggest that that one way of reading Voldemort's evil is through white supremacy. Reading that evil as white supremacy, which helps us shift away from that really tricky aspect of the text, which is constantly insisting that this is just an evil kid. Sometimes I get worried about aligning wizarding supremacy and white supremacy too closely together, although I think they can be really usefully, like mutually illuminating or... Oh, yeah, it's an allegory that crumbles very quickly when you apply pressure. It's like a gluten-free cookie. That's right. That's right. You know, you look at it and it looks okay, but you apply a little bit of pressure to it and it just turns to dust. Unlike and a like, soul cookie. Which unlike is, a soul cookie, which breaks apart really nicely. Right. Clean, clean snap. But I, but I think there is something really important about like the, what links them really importantly is this idea that something about the refusal of death, refusal to be vulnerable to others, mm-hmm. and not just that refusal, but the willingness to make others suffer for the sake of your illusion that you need not die or be vulnerable. That is something that is held in common between them and I think really is illuminating. But it seems like those characters which have more robust soul lives in the Harry Potter series are ones who are not willing to do this, who are willing to face death and are willing to be vulnerable to others, right? I mean, certainly the major example of that in this book is Dumbledore. The whole arc for Dumbledore in this book is that he knows that he is dying, that he does not resist it. That his focus is on dying in such a way that his death does not harm someone else, right? That he's, like, really making sure that, like, Malfoy doesn't kill him because he does not want this damage done to this child. And on, like, you know, doing as much as he can before he dies. But he makes it very clear from book one, right? He says, wise men do not fear death. And that is the question of what you do when you're afraid of dying versus what you do when you are not afraid of dying is the closest thing we've got to like a theological through line in these books. I think that's right. And he's trying to save Malfoy's soul, right? I mean, he's trying to save the soul of this child, right? By keeping Malfoy from doing exactly what Voldemort does, from harming another in order to save save oneself. At some point, we will have to talk more about allegory because this book is... This whole series is a study in just the shakiest allegories. Fantastic allegories and where to find them. Fantastic allegories and where to find them. It does make me think about the allegorical tradition of Christian literature and how frequently 
you know, like Pilgrim's Progress, right? Like how frequently the sort of spiritual progression of the soul is rendered metaphorical through some sort of narrative journey. Like the hero's journey. Like the hero's journey. So you know what, actually, Marcel, your revision was spot on yet again. Jeez, Hannah. (laughs) But I don't know, it's helpful for me as a reader to like detach a little bit from the (laughs) from the specifics of the metaphysical system that Rowling seems to be putting in place. Say more. Say more about that. There's a particular tradition of reading that we see a lot in fandoms um, that I actually think comes out of a biblical hermeneutics, where you are like reading for internal consistency, looking for gaps, and then developing theories that allow you to reconcile those gaps. For sure. You know, there's a there's a kind of pleasure in a certain kind of reading, say, of Harry Potter, where you're just pointing out how absurd so much of it is. Because it is just full of gaps. There's so many, like, the financial system doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the amount of money that things cost is truly... It's just wild. It's just Indeed, absolutely wild. The entire publishing industry, <laughs> the entire publishing, as you industry. dissected in that episode, <laughs> doesn't make Ludicrous. sense. What does it mean to be a bestseller in a community of five hundred people? <laughs> I don't. What do you? How many books did you sell? <laughs> I don't understand. So, like, there's a pleasure in that. That is fun. But there's also a lot that you miss when you do that. And I think one of the things that you miss is that kind of. Uh, Matt, what you were referring to as like using text as a way of working through other ideas that like we can work through the ideas in the text or we can use the text to work through other ideas that we want to think about. And so we could spend a bunch of time, maybe we will, thinking about the metaphysical nature of the soul in Harry Potter and and how it is exactly that it breaks apart. You know, fantasy novels are often really interested in these like metaphysical, you know, this is the magic system in books that it's like, okay, how do you actually conceive of this? I think one of the things that characterizes Harry Potter for the most part is that the magic is very poorly thought through, which most sort of fantasy readers would agree. But it just makes so much more sense to me to think about the soul metaphorically. Marcel, you look unconvinced. You still want to talk about the physical nature of the soul. No, I just want, what do you, what do you want to do with it? I mean, exactly this. This is exactly what I want to do with it, right? I want to think about what it tells us about the relationship between evil and immortality, which seem deeply intertwined in the books. You know, we are presented right from the beginning with a villain whose two major characteristics are that he is evil and he wants to be immortal. And From there, the books are a series of encounters with the sort of monstrosity of this attempt at immortality. You know, meeting Tom Riddle in the journal, you know, the journal is monstrous because it is another extension of that attempt at immortality, you know, and it's backed up by this basilisk, which is itself another attempt at immortality, right? There are all of these things that are about people trying to never die, And the thing again and again that Harry does is be willing to die. Like, he does it in the most significant way in the seventh book, but he kind of does it in almost every book. So I think that's right. And that's why the obsession with immortality bears out as evil. And the relinquishing of immortality bears out as goodness. Until the very end when you're like, oh, surprise, actually, the the goodness is what gets you immortality and badness is what leads to to losing that immortality, right? Like, it seems like at the end, the books kind of lose their nerve and they grant immortality to the good who have been willing to give it up and take it away from those who have been fighting for it so desperately. So it's just like a trick. It's just you have to know the right way there, which is to be willing to give it up. That, that I feel like it loses its nerve at the end. Because only if you're willing to give it up, are you a pure enough soul to actually to get it. be allowed to have it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's such a common narrative trope is like the only way you cannot die is by being willing to die. Where's that narrative trope come from? I mean, it certainly comes, there's, there's a version of Christianity that, that that says that pretty strongly. I mean, this is this idea of 
like unless you take up your cross and follow me, you won't have eternal life. Like this comes out of the New Testament. There is this idea that it's only be in being willing to die that you find new life. That's language that comes out of the, of the Christian tradition. But I, I also think that lots of interpretations of the Christian tradition lose their nerve in the same way that I think book seven loses its mm. nerve. I have other readings of the resurrection so maybe when you do book seven, we can talk more about that. Whoa, what a cliffhanger. <laughs> we definitely have to bring you back to talk about book seven, because we are obviously all champion at the bit to talk about what exactly becomes of Voldemort's soul. But gosh, we've learned a lot today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, witches, for joining us for another episode of Witch Please. Witch Please is produced in partnership with Wilfrid Laurier University Press and distributed by Acast. You can find the rest of our episodes by visiting the podcast section of the Wilfrid Laurier University Press website or, as always, on your podcast listening platform of choice. If you want to hang out with us some more, we're on Twitter and Instagram at ohwitchplease with a ton of hot new varying content thanks to our Witch Please Apprentice, Zoe Mix. Thanks, Zoe. And special thanks, as always, to our team player of a producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach. Thanks, Coach. And thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon. We've just added some thrilling new perks, including a blooper reel, and blooper reel based comics created by our very own Zoe. Real blooper based comics? Real blooper based comics. That was a good pun, Marcel. I liked it. <laughs> Head over to patreon.com slash oh witch please to check out the rest of our truly incredible content. If you're not able to contribute financially, but you still want to lend us a hand, we would absolutely love it if you dropped us a review on Apple Podcasts. At the end of every episode, we'll shout out everyone who left us a five-star review. So you've got to review us if you want to find out who will save your soul if you won't save your own. la di da 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 Thank you to A. Merrill, Itty Bitty Britty, and... You're a doctor, Harry. That was not a good Robbie Coltrane impression <laughs> at all. And I'm so sorry that it happened. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next episode to continue our discussion of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. But until then... Later, witches.